Well, good morning and uh, happy Wednesday. We are continuing this, uh, this study in the theological deep end of Philippians chapter 2. The Carmen Christi, this hymn, perhaps the oldest Christian hymn, dropped by Paul into his letter to the, the believers in the church in Philippi. So we've looked at two of the steps that Jesus took sort of down the ladder of success. We think of climbing up the ladder of success. He took two steps down that we looked at yesterday. He was willing to be slighted, uh, willing to give up heaven, willing to give up the rights and honors uh, that were his, willing to set aside the Shekinah glory in order to show up on earth. And secondly, he actually did it. It wasn't just in theory. The third step down he took is that he became one of us. Uh, he took on all the essential attributes of being a real person. He wasn't just God in a human shell or God in a bod, as, as one of the early church heresies was, uh, was the way I remembered it in seminary. He, he was, it wasn't a photo op that God shows up and looks like one of us. He takes on all the essential attributes of being human. He's like us in every way except sin. There's a great mystery here, uh, just sort of on par with the Trinity, that God could be um, one God in three persons. We have the, what we call the hypostatic union, that Jesus could be one person with two natures. He's fully God and he's fully man. There's a mystery here. This gets spelled out a bit in the Chalcedonian definition, which followed the Nicene Creed. So early on, the first fight that, uh, the, that the church had to, to face was those that said Jesus was not fully God. He was almost God, but not completely God. The second fight they had was those that said, oh, he was God. He just wasn't really a person. He just looked like a person, or he was just briefly a person or whatever. And so in the Chalcedonian definition, they state that, that veris deus, veris homo, he's truly God and truly man. And then it brackets it, it gives us what we call the four fences. And it says that the, these two uh, natures exist in perfect unity without mixture, um, division, confusion, or separation. So as I said, th this is the theological deep end, and we can't really tease all of this out. But here's, here's the fourth point, uh, the fourth step down that he takes. It begins to take on some, some real um, application points. He not only becomes a man, he becomes a servant. Um, he might have shown up on earth as a human, but as a king, as the highest, most exalted king. That would be a huge demotion from being God in heaven. But he doesn't come as a king. He doesn't come as the greatest human of all times in the sense that he's getting all this glory and honor and accolades from everybody. He's, he's universally recognized and esteemed. He doesn't show up like one of the Greek gods who, you know, shows up on earth to have some adventures and sleep with some human women and other things. He shows up not even as a regular person. He shows up as a servant. And, and the turn, it says, in the, he was in the very form of God. Greek word is morphe. He was in the very form of God. Now he's in the very form form the very nature of a servant. So there's lots of people that we occasionally look at to think, I want to be like them. I want to be, I want to be able to play basketball like Michael Jordan, or I want to be able to play, you know, uh, golf like, uh, like Tiger Woods or Arnold Palmer or Jack Nicholas, or I want to be, I want to be as, as, as successful as uh, Bill Gates or as thoughtful as somebody, you know, but, but but the example that we're being given, the best person that we're being given is, is not somebody who sort of climbs to the top. It's somebody who climbs down. There's much for us to consider here. And Jesus hasn't descended as far as he's going to go. We'll pick this up tomorrow.